Hey gamer, welcome back to Hearthstone, the only game where you watch more of it than you play it. You remember quest lines, those little quests that came out in United and Stormwind? Those were fun, weren't they? But weren't they actually a problem? To answer this question, we're going to go all the way back to Journey to Angoro to see what the first iterations of quests were in Hearthstone. The quests in Journey to Angoro were pretty awesome. A lot of them had a very simple win condition that took a long time to actually get to the reward, and the benefit of most of the rewards is that they were just a one-time effect. Look at the last Kaleidosaur. This quest has had you cast six spells on your minions. The reward was Galvadon, which obviously wasn't the most powerful quest reward, but it was just a one time thing. It was a very powerful play that you can make that hopefully could win you the game, but it wasn't an ongoing effect. As you look at the rest of the quest, the ones that made the biggest impact in the metagame were Fireplume's Heart, the Caverns Below, and Open the Way Gate. Fireplume's Heart reward was Sulphurous, which made your hero power turn into Ragnaroses. Now, obviously, this was a very powerful effect that earlier you got it, the more value you got from the hero power, but the downside to this was that it was completely random, but still over a lengthy game of grinding out your opponents, this hero power dominated the game. And even though this had an ongoing effect after the quest was finished, it still took a very long time to finish, which means even though you got endless value off your hero power every single turn, by the time you actually got it, it was quite late in the game where something like this could happen. Open the way gate gave you the reward time war, which enabled the player to have an extra turn. And because because this reward was a spell, it was very easy to discount it using two Sorcerer's Apprentice and Molten Reflection, basically making this a one mana card. Even though this quest took a long time to complete, the reward was absolutely bonkers. It was basically a free win like a combo deck against virtually any slow deck because you had so many different ways of killing your opponent. This introduces us to our first bigger problem with quest lines, polarization. When a card causes polarization, it causes the player to only feel really two emotions. They're either really happy that they're playing against it or they just don't want to play the game at all. This brings me to the last and the most important quest from Mongoro, the Caverns Below. The reason why this is the most important is because this gave you the Crystal Core, which said for the rest of the game, your minions are 5-5. When we consider the Mage quest, the biggest thing about it is how long it took to actually finish that quest. It took a very long portion of the game to actually get to the point where you can kill your opponent in one turn. But the Crystal Core had this quest completed around turn four or five because of what Rogue had at the time. Cards like Shadow Step, Youthful Brewmaster, basically any way to bounce a minion back to your hand allowed this quest line to be completed a lot faster, which means that this quest alone was the most polarizing card in the history of Hearthstone. Because the only way you really lost with this quest is that if a deck was just faster than you. So you had to either play an aggressive deck or you lost to the Crystal Core. In comparison to the Caverns Below, we have Jungle Giants which gave you the reward Barnabas, which had the battle cry to reduce the cost of minions in your deck to zero. Now, obviously this effect is very powerful. The biggest difference between this and the caverns below was the amount of counterplay that this allowed. This quest did not get finished until much later in the game. This was a much harder quest to complete, which means mid range deck had a chance to beat you and combo deck still had a chance to beat you. Whereas the caverns below just was too fast. Next, we're going to move on to Savers of Uldum, where they brought back quests for the very second time. You could clearly tell that from Journey to Angoro, they learned a bunch of stuff. So rather than the quests giving you a minion to play once you completed them, they all gave you a brand new hero power. Almost all of these quests weren't that good. There was a couple of outliers in here and some of them had their moment to shine. Like Supreme Archaeology really found its footing as a quest with future expansions added to the game. But for a majority of the time they were in standard, only two of the quests really saw play. And those were Corrupt the Water is an untapped potential. The hero power that you got from Corrupt the Waters was the Heart of Vernal, which allowed your battle cries to trigger twice this turn. It goes without saying that this was a very powerful effect. Spending two mana to double your battle cries was very good for tempo and value. This one really reminds me of the Warrior Quest from Angoro because once this quest was finally completed, the game kind of changed drastically. It was no longer playing awkward battle cry minions. It was how much tempo and value can I get from each individual battle cry? Just like the Warrior Quest, the longer the game went, the more value and tempo you would receive for this, and this would be able to generate you a bunch of cards and get you a bunch of different lethal options because, wow, you would get a lot of resources just from a single hero power. Now, I think there is an argument against this quest talking about how after the quest was completed, the game felt just completely different, and it was more about can I actually kill this shaman before I just lose to endless resources and tempo, but I think overall, because you have to spend two mana on the hero power, it didn't really feel that bad to play against. 
against. It definitely had its very strong moments, but overall didn't really feel like it was warping the meta around it. But let's talk about untapped potential. Now, untapped potential is the caverns below equivalent in Sabres of Uldum. The idea of this questline alone was extremely polarizing. You had to end four turns with any unspent mana. Just like the caverns below, the polarization in terms of just matchup was ridiculous. If I'm playing this quest druid and I go against an aggressive deck, there's a really good chance I just straight up lose the game. And if I'm going against a slower deck, I have a very high likelihood to just win the game straight up. And that is because of the reward you received with this quest. You got a Syrian tier, which was a passive hero power. Your choose one cards have both effects combined. And just like the caverns below, once this quest was completed, the game became an entirely different game. It felt like after the quest was completed, it was no longer a game of Hearthstone. It was just watching Druid play good cards over and over and over again. Regardless of how you felt about the quest, the biggest thing about it is that it was a passive ongoing effect, just like the caverns below. It's kind of funny when you look at the best quests from Ungoro and Uldum that they both had an ongoing effect after the quest was completed. They both just had passive effects, which brings me to quest lines. When you look at all the quest lines from Unite and Stormwind, the ones that caused the biggest problems in the most amount of polarizations are the ones that had a passive ongoing effect. Command the Elements, Defend the Dwarven District, Sorcerer's Gambit, the Demon Seed all had an ongoing effect without actually doing anything. Obviously, Rise to the Occasion is an ongoing effect after you complete it. Biggest difference between those quest lines and the ones I previously mentioned is card draw. Card draw is what makes a quest line consistent. And if a quest line is consistent, that means there's constant polarization, which means Hearthstone isn't as fun of a game anymore. No one wants to play against the same thing over and over again. And if something is that powerful causing polarization, that means you either have to try to beat it or you'll just lose every game possible. When you look at the quest line Sorcerer's Gambit before it was nerfed, the idea of this quest line is very simple. Finish your quest, kill your opponent as fast as possible using a bunch of burn spells, which means if you were a slower deck that could not put any pressure on the mage, you were strictly going to die over and over again, which means the only thing you could do to beat it was play an aggressive style deck, which causes polarization just like the caverns below. Answer the question, are quest lines a problem? Yes in the right circumstances. The thing about quests is how consistent they can be completed in terms of how powerful their effect is. When you look at the last Kaleidosaur, the effect is not hard to complete. You could do it pretty early on in a game, but the effect is a one-time thing that may get you some board control, and that's about it. When you look at the Sorcerer's Gambit, the quest is way too easy to complete for the effect that you get after. The same thing could have been said for the Caverns Below and the Demon Seed. All of them were way too consistent in completing it. You may notice that all of these quest lines got nerfed in some way. Even Command the Elements got nerfed because they had to slow down how consistent you got that effect going in order for the quest lines not to be as polarizing. The amount of card draw also matters for these quest lines, but I don't think card draw really matters as much as long as the quest line can't be consistently completed as fast, which means there's way more counterplay to each individual quest. Because when there's counterplay to a quest, that means there's less polarization in each individual matchup. For instance, if I'm going against the Demon Seed and I'm playing a slower deck, I have more time to play big threatening minions to slow down the completion of the quest line, which means the warlock doesn't consistently complete their quest line as fast. I do want to mention one thing about quests and quest lines that I think a lot of people don't actually focus on. The benefit of printing a card like this is that it only takes up one slot in an expansion, and it's very easy to build a deck around this archetype, where if they're printing mech mage, they have to put a lot of cards into mech mage in order for that archetype to actually work, where quest lines only need one card to actually do something. The reason why I bring up this topic is because the new expansion Voyage in the Sunken City is about to come out with rotation. And I have a feeling that one of these quest lines is going to be very powerful in this new expansion. And if it so happens to be a very consistent and polarizing matchup, I hope the developers realize this as fast as possible so we can actually have fun in the expansion and not go through United and Stormwind again. But yeah, I don't think necessarily that quests or quest lines are a problem, but they're a problem when they're consistent causing a polarization in matchups because that's no fun for anyone because we're here to play Hearthstone, not rock, paper, scissors. With that being said, thanks for watching my video. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.